Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you very much for having me again at the Toronto Perioperative TE Symposium. It's a honor to be with you. I'd like to be there in person. I hope we can meet each other again soon. Um, and thanks, Azad, and congratulations for the excellent job that you've been doing and that you've done again with this conference. Um, as, <clears throat> as, as, as you asked me, I'm now talking about um, structural heart disease uh, and presenting, I will presenting a few cases where echocardiography played a significant role in the procedures and in the planning. Uh, for the best patient care. I have uh, no conflict of interest in regards to this talk. I uh, do have a few disclosures. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, board for National Board of Echocardiography basic exam um, preparation. Uh, and at Health Centrum Leipzig, we are a reference center for Philips, uh, therefore, we uh, don't get any money from Philips, but we get device, we get um, echo machines and software, and uh, all of our images are uh, Philips. And I've also um, um, received honorarium from Hubbard for um, to talk about some of the products and echo for some of the devices that are um, uh, made by this company. So uh, as, uh, as just said, I'll be presenting two cases. We'll be uh, having a case of uh, Tavi. Uh, and um, here is again, something relatively new. We've been moving away from TE for Tavi and now we're getting TE back in the, back in the game and is starting to play again, an interesting role in some of these cases. And then we will be talking, presenting another case of transcatheter mitral valve implantation. Our first patient uh, who presented to us uh, about two months ago was an 84 years old man um, who um, uh, presented for TAVI. He had a previous aortic valve replacement in 2004 with a stentless bioprosthesis that failed 10 years later was replaced by a, um, uh, with a triflecta aortic valve uh, prosthesis. And in between, he also had bypasses on the left coronary system and all of the bypasses were, were patent, were open. He had chronic renal insufficiency, he had a permanent pacemaker, peripheral vascular disease, heart failure, and the indication for Tavi was severe aortic insufficiency. When we met the day before the procedure with our um, uh, heart team, uh, our radiologist presented the CT. And as you can see here, it's, uh, it's relatively uh, easy to see how um, the coronary arteries, the ostia of the coronary arteries are just above the ring of these uh, bioprosthesis. And so you can clearly imagine we draw here, they drew the, the casts of this um, uh, prosthesis that as we, and if we deploy a valve inside this prosthesis, the, the leaflet will certainly obstruct these um, coronary ostia because the coronary ostia are too low. Now, for the left coronary ostia is ostium is not much of a deal a big deal because we have bypasses they are patent but for the right coronary ostia obviously um, uh, if we deploy a valve and if we don't do anything that may, will most likely result into a complete obstruction of the right coronary ostia therefore we uh, talked about or was suggested to do a basilica procedure what is a basilica procedure? Basilica has nothing to do with the famous basilica in Rome, but uh, it has to do with a complex acronym that means bioprosthetic aortic valve scallop intentional laceration to prevent iatrogenic coronary artery obstruction. And this is the first paper where uh, the group from here, from Leipzig, in, uh, led by Mohammed Abdel Wahab, uh, described this technique. Here is uh, going back to the, to the CT scan. On the left is the left coronary artery. On the right is the right coronary artery. And here the, card, the radiologist showed how 
is the coronary artery ostium oriented in respect to the center of the leaflet in this patient. And you can see that in the right, on the right coronary artery, the ostium is oriented seven degrees, it's seven degrees from the center of the, of the, of the leaflet yeah, towards the, the left side. And so if we want to cut this leaflet in half in order to prevent yeah, the leaflet to um, obstruct the ostium, then we want to cut the ostium right in front. We want to cut the leaflet right in front of the ostium. So this is, for example, a diagram that I made with like famous uh, Mercedes-Benz sign. This is the right coronary um, cusp. And we want to cut it right in front of the ostium towards the center of the valve. This is our patient at the baseline, the baseline uh, echo. You can see a long axis view with X plane. There's an aortic insufficiency, which is in this case actually a good news because normally patients who have aortic insufficiency, if we do a, um, a basilica and we cause more aortic insufficiency, that's usually way better tolerated than patients who have no aortic insufficiency and then suddenly develop significant aortic insufficiency with the basilica procedure. Now we can now, now uh, look at the left ventricle, right ventricle, there's no wall motion abnormalities. And in the deep transgastric view, we can appreciate how this regurgitant jet is actually quite eccentric and flows uh, against the interventricular septum on the right. So here is our short axis view. And from this view, by small movement of the probe in and out, we want to try to identify the cusp of the mitral valve, which the aortic, the, the, we want to identify the ostium of the coronary artery, which I think it's somewhere around, somewhere around here. Yeah. And now what I did is I took our CT scan and I I I flipped it up and down and right and left to orient the cusp. To orient, the, uh, to orient this uh, picture the same way as the echo. And here where I put my now my arrow is where probably where we um, uh, uh, can appreciate the right coronary uh, ostium. And that's where we would want to, uh, from there, we want to start a cut towards the center of the, of the leaflet. Uh, echocardiography plays a, an important role in, uh, in, um, in the basilica uh, procedure. And no one has described it before, and we were lucky and honored to be able to uh, write about it and publish this paper last year on JACE, where we described the role of ECHO and what are the steps and what we need to look for with ECHO for this basilica procedure. Basilica procedure uh, uh, is uh, made of a few steps. So the first step uh, is um, consists of putting a loop or like a, over a catheter under the valve that we want to cut. So that's the snare system positioning. And you can see that there's this catheter that goes through the aortic valve here in the LVOT. We don't see the loop here because of the orientation. We can already see it with echo. Now we've positioned the loop. Now comes the second and most important catheter. There's the catheter, that's the transversal system. So it's a catheter that needs to be positioned exactly where we want to poke the leaflet. Where do we want to poke the leaflet? Right against the annulus yeah, or the ring here. And um, uh, right where the ostium of the uh, coronary artery is. So in this case, we have our catheter was positioned exactly there. And now if we're once we're lucky, when we're happy with the positioning of this catheter, through the catheter, we get a, a wire, an electrified wire, and as we apply cautery to this wire, we go through the, 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 the cusps of, the, uh, of this bioprosthetic valve. And we can see we've gone through, the, the wire goes through the valve. And as we pop through the valve, you see that generates a little bit of bubbles. And now we want to fish this wire back up with the snare. So you can see on fluoroscopy, we've now caught this wire with the snare and now the snare, like the wire, it's on one hand comes out of this catheter here on, on at the at the annulus here at the ring yeah, of the bioprosthesis. The wire goes through the, 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 the cusp, comes into the second wire up. Yeah. 
So the snaring is complete. Yeah, and we can see that there's two catheters, one and two. One is here at the at the ring, at the annulus, and the other one is in the center. And these catheters we put tension on both. They take sort of a V, uh, like they appear like a V. This is also described as the flying V sign. Doesn't really mean much. It's simply that once we apply tension on the catheter, the two catheters are oriented, and the tips are oriented like a V. Now we apply to the wire in the catheter, electricity again, so cautery with like a normal uh, surgical cautery uh, system. And we pull the wire and now we've lacerated the leaflet. We've lacerated the leaflet, the patient tolerated it well. We have a little bit more aortic insufficiency. In this case, we, what we also appreciated that happens often is that we may not be able to see exactly where, like where this new, jet comes from unless there is no unless there is no insufficiency before but in this case we definitely can see that the initial jet is different so the uh, insufficiency is definitely as like the jet the the, the, the backflow has a different morphology and here actually comes from the anterior or like the the right or what was what corresponds to the most anterior cusps that corresponds to the native right coronary cusp Done the procedure, we decided only to do the right because the left coronary system is, um, uh, has the bypasses that are still open. Uh, so then we proceed to deploy an ev ev evolutar procedure, uh, 23 millimeter that's deployed based on fluoroscopy. On echo, we can see how the valve is released, the valve is released, and now the valve pushed the new valve, the core valve, push the uh, leaflet of this bioprosthesis on the, against the, the, the aortic root. And because one was lacerated, that's the right was lacerated, the um, uh, flow in the right coronary um, ostium is preserved. There's no wall motion abnormalities. And um, there was a, a successful procedure without paravalvular leak and with sort of acceptable gradient with this new prosthesis. The second case is a younger patient who presented with severe mitra regurgitation, severe tricuspid regurgitation. Um, uh, after uh, with, uh, so patient who had a mitral valve repair 2008 uh, and multiple comorbidities, atrial fibrillation, chronic renal insufficiency, uh, uh, anemia, cerebral infarct, hemiparesis, TIAs, epilepsy, peripheral vascular disease. Given um, the, the high risk for conventional surgery, it was proposed to uh, 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 deal with the aortic mitral valve regurgitation with the tendine valve. The tendine valve is a, uh, um, is a, 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 a wire, so relatively invasive, not, not minimally invasive because it's done through the apex of the heart but transapical uh, valve system that's delivered through a catheter. You can see here the catheter through the uh, mitral valve leaflet. This is the uh, tendine valve. The valve can be, uh, it's positioned, it sits on the native um, uh, mitral valve annulus and um, can be uh, um, uh, re um, um, grasped and taken out if we're not happy with the positioning. Uh, or reposition, uh, adjusted the position. And once we're happy with it, how it sits on the annulus, then the valve has a string that comes outside of the heart through the apex and the pad holds the string in place and holds the valve. So then the valve sits yeah, uh, on the native annulus. This is our patient, giant atria. Uh, uh, as you can, uh, you can see the mitral valve ring that was um, uh, uh, sewn on the previous procedure, uh, mitral valve insufficiency in the long axis, you can appreciate even, uh, so even higher degree of uh, mitral valve insufficiency. The problem was here that when we thought about tendine valve, now you look at this anterior mitral valve leaflet, and you look at, at the tendine valve, how it sits on the mitral valve. And you can appreciate that the tendine valve is at least two centimeter high. 
So if we deploy a, a, a tendine valve in this patient with this long anterior mitral valve leaflet that you see here, then what's left for blood flow in the LBOT is limited, very limited, and it's like extremely small, yeah, opening below where would the, the, core, the tendine valve end and the interventricular septum. Not only because this anterior mitral valve leaflet is long, but also because the angle between the interventricular septum and the ascending aorta is relatively acute. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a short. It, it's not. Uh, it's it's uh, there's there's quite an angle between the septum and the aorta, the ascending aorta ascendance. Yeah. So what we decided to do is, or what we consider to do, is to do so-called lampoon procedure. Lampoon procedure is, a, is a basically the, the use of the same technique that you see for the saw for the aortic valve, but applied to the mitral valve. So we poke the anterior mitral valve leaf with, with an electrified wire that's caught by a, a snare. Here is a, in this animation done through the aortic valve, so from the aortic arch. Now we electrify this wire, we pull, and then we cut the anterior mitral valve leaflet. And this is the difference between having deployed a valve inside the mitral valve with lampoon or without lampoon. And with lampoon, the, valve, the anterior leaflet is split in half, and that's a core um, a, a sapiens valve, as you can see, that sits in the mitral valve position. This is our patient. We look at the ring here. We look at on the right with color, massive mitral regurgitation. What's interesting though, is that when we're looking at the unfast view here, I would have expected to find the aortic valve right here at 12 o'clock in respect to my annulus. But in this patient, the aortic valve is actually not sitting at 12 o'clock in respect to the mitral valve ring here. It's actually sitting at like 10, 11 o'clock here. So at the level of the lateral commissure of the mitral valve. So what was interesting is, okay, so normally with the lampoon procedure, we cut the uh, anterior leaflet of the mitral valve in half where this uh, arrow uh, is here. But in this case, that's not exactly where the LBOT is. The LBOT is more, a little bit more lateral and at a slightly different angle. So that's where we decided just based on 3D, yeah, where we would be poking the anterior mitral valve leaflets and where we're gonna proceed with the lampoon procedure. The first step though, was uh, the trans transapical approach. So before we started anything, we wanted to be ready to then deploy the tendine valve. So we first identify the apex of the heart, which is a critical step. You see with the finger of the surgeon is poking on the apex of the valve here. And we're trying to yeah, identify the apex, yeah, where the apex is. We, we do a, 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 per, a purse string around the apex. And then we start with the lampoon procedure. In our case, we did it through the inter atrial septum. That's the, trans, the, the transeptal puncture catheter that came down. This is an indentation we poke right in the center of the fossa ovalis and superior uh, uh, in, um, so sorry, and posterior, so center and posterior. And here is the catheter through the inter uh, atrial septum. Through the catheter, we park a wire as for clips in the uh, left upper pulmonary vein. And then we advance a second catheter through the inter um, uh, atrial septum, because for this procedure, we'll need two catheters at the same time, which we can appreciate them on 3D on the right, which is something that normally we don't see when we do other procedure through the septum, because we only have one catheter and one wire. So now we proceed with the, with the lampoon. The lampoon starts with um, the um, positioning of snare system, similarly to what we saw for the basilica procedure. The snare system is positioned under the mitral valve. And you can see here that there's one catheter that's going through the mitral valve and it's like sitting in the left ventricle. And now the, sec the, the second step is the positioning of the transverse system. So the transverse system uh, is this catheter that needs to be positioned where we want to poke the leaflet. And you can see 
then now the position in 3D here, it's exactly where we saw before where we wanna poke. We're not, we don't wanna poke right in the middle here. We wanna poke more towards the, um, towards the uh, lateral commissure. And here you can see that also the catheter in the, uh, this mitral commissural view is a little bit not right in the center, but a bit more lateral. And here you can appreciate the angle of incidence of this catheter in respect to the leaflet. And we want to poke and position this catheter as close as possible to the annulus of the mitral valve. Once we're happy, once we were happy with the positioning, then we electrify the wire inside the catheter, we push the wire through, and now the wire is through the anterior mitral valve leaflet. As we poke through the, through the leaflet, we got a little bit of bubbles. And now the wire has to be catch, caught by the loop that's underneath, and here we were lucky that playing around with the, with the, with the probe, we managed to get a, also a short axis view with the loop with the wire inside. And now the loop is pulled back and the, the wire is near. And then now we have uh, uh, something similar to what we saw before for the aortic valve with like sort of like a V or like a flying V where we have like one catheter goes in, the second catheter that goes out, the wire is in the middle. We're sort of ready to electrify and pull back and um, we electrify, we pull back, and now we've lacerated the anterior mitral valve leaflet. On 3D, this is how it looked with uh, our mitral insufficiency that was there. And now it's, there's also obviously even more mitral insufficiency given the degree of mitral insufficiency to begin with. In this case, this laceration didn't make a big difference um, to the hemodynamics of the patient, so patient was stable. And now we can proceed with our uh, tendine deployment. We have a wire, a needle that's passed through the apex where the uh, um, first string was made. The needle is directed to the uh, mitral valve. Now a wire is inserted over the wire, the delivery catheter is inserted. And now through the delivery catheter, we need to position our valve. Now let's go back one step and let's look at this tendine valve. So the tendine valve, the top of the valve is not flat, is, um, has a saddle shape, just like the native mitral valve annulus. And just to remember that the tendine valve is higher anteriorly and lower posteriorly. So you can see here that this portion of the valve is, is higher than, than the, 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 the portion at the back. So then as we orient this valve, how do we orient it? So how do we orient the highest portion? Do we orient it in respect to the aortic valve here or do we orient it in respect to the mitral valve annulus? And what we decided to do is to orient it in respect to the mitral valve annulus because that's exactly, that's where this valve is gonna sit. So regardless of the fact that the aortic valve is here at 11 o'clock, then we still orient our valve. So then the highest portion is like oriented towards the anterior portion of this uh, mitral valve ring. We start to deploy the valve. Yeah, and as we release the valve, uh, you see that this is the highest portion that comes here anteriorly. This is the aortic valve is still here at like sort of 11 o'clock. And there's a point where the valve is, um, the top of the valve is deployed, but the bottom of the valve is not completely released. And there's basically no flow through the valve and no flow through the mitral valve. And as you can appreciate it by the smoke that you have here in the, in the, in the left atrium. And now the valve is fully deployed. We have normal flow to the valve. And now if we look in the long axis, unfortunately, the valve is stable. Is now the string is pulled through the pad at the apex of the ventricle. There is though a um, um, here and pa anterior paravalvular leak. The gradient across this new valve was uh, four millimeters of mercury and there's no LVOT. Um, flow acceleration. So the lampoon procedure was successful. There's also no uh, turbulent flow, although it's not easy to assess the turbulent flow given the shadow from the valve itself. Here is in 3D, the valve is fully deployed, sits nicely, opens nicely, and you can see, and you can appreciate the location of this paravalvular leak, which is comes exactly from where we started cutting this anterior mitral valve. 
We try to adjust the tension on the valve by increasing the tension on the string to see if this paravalvular liquid get better. But unfortunately, despite our attempts, the paravalvular leak stay there. So we sort of accepted it as um, a sort of not perfect, but still acceptable result for this patient. So uh, Basilica procedure for TAVI is now becoming more and more common. We do hear roughly more or less one, one every two weeks. Um, obviously ECHO then has come back into the TAVI uh, room as well as general anesthesia because whenever we do ECHO, we also do general anesthesia. Uh, for Basilica, uh, our cardiologist, and we believe that uh, echo makes a big difference. It decreases the amount of radiation, increases the, the precision in which we, 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 we do the procedure, and it also allows us to promptly detect complications and manage them then consecutively in a more uh, prompt way. Um, we need to know the steps of these procedures and uh, we need to follow what the cardiologists are doing on fluoroscopy. We're lucky that here we have a, a screen just over, I have a screen just over my echo uh, machine. So I can, I just by moving my eyes, I can see the fluoroscopy on this, on the second screen. Uh, so which obviously uh, increased uh, our uh, communication and so, and also sometimes uh, I ask the cardiologist to, to just turn on the fluoroscopy to see where my probe is in respect to the structures and respect to the devices that we're using. Uh, sometimes it helps to optimize the quality of my images. Um, Lampoon is uh, now become an option uh, for mitral valve, um, valve in valve and uh, more than ever is important to appreciate and understand the three-dimensional anatomy of the mitral valve and the LVOT and three, the echocardiography plays and makes a huge difference here in guiding our colleagues to um, uh, um, uh, complete a successful procedure. I need to thank uh, the um, interventionalists with, with, with whom I've been working in the past two years and who've, who do all of uh, this procedure in our hybrid OR, um, and particularly Philip Lourdes and uh, Christian Bessler and Mohammed Abdel Wahab, uh, who um, have um, been very patient, especially at the beginning when I couldn't speak good German, um, to, um, to work with me and from whom I've really learned a lot, together with uh, uh, Professor Ender, who's my chief who's uh, mentored me and helped me uh, uh, learn and be integrated in this team uh, and um, to whom I owe all I know in, in this new and exciting field of uh, intraoperative echocardiography. Here is my email. You're welcome to email me anytime. Uh, you're welcome to visit us anytime. It's, it's, if you come to Europe, you pass by here. We're not far from Berlin. We are in sort of former uh, um, East Germany, not far from the Polish border. We're easy to reach. Uh, and uh, next year in June, I'd like to take this opportunity to personally invite you to join our T masterclass which is going to be a three days event um, with uh, on live transmission of real cases uh, from our uh, um, uh, operating room, um, not only cardiac room, but also hybrid rooms. Um, there's lots of uh, uh, good names that are going to come as, uh, as the speakers to our conference. Uh, the conference will be uh, both in presence, so you can come to Leipzig and see our center as well as online. So you can also follow us from Canada. Um, once again, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for having me. And I hope we uh, uh, will have the opportunity to meet in person soon. Bye.